Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our session, Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. I'm really delighted to have such a distinguished panel here today. So allow me to quick introduce all the panelists, even though I do expect that you all know the panelists here on stage. First and foremost, His Excellency Khalid Fali, Minister of Energy, Industry and Mineral Resources of Saudi Arabia. We have here Lawrence Fink, the Chairman and the CEO of BlackRock in New York. We have Minister Al Kasabi, who is Minister of Commerce and Investment of Saudi Arabia. We have, from the private sector also, Andrew Laviris, Chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical. Warm welcome. And last but not least, we have the Finance Minister of Saudi Arabia, Minister Mohammed Jadan, Excellency. A warm welcome to all of you. Big round of applause to our today's panel. Minister Al-Fali, allow me to start with you. Can you give us a quick, brief overview, even with a huge project, about the Saudi Vision 2030? Well, uh, thank you, Philip. And indeed, uh, it is huge, it is audacious, it is ambitious. Uh, and the word transformative doesn't give it justice. And before I describe what Vision 2030 is all about, I think it's perhaps take a a minute and set the stage and talk about where Saudi Arabia starts from. We have a solid uh, base to build on. The Saudi economy is the largest in the Middle East. It's a very substantial GDP that we have, over 1.6 trillion uh, Saudi rial. We have a stable uh, currency pegged uh, to the dollar. We have a very strong fiscal uh, position. We have a robust uh, consumption uh, in the kingdom, so those in the private sector know Saudi Arabia is a very attractive market, very open, no currency restrictions. Uh, one of the best uh, businesses, places to do business, the infrastructure in Saudi Arabia in many areas uh, is world class. Obviously, there are gaps uh, here and there. And uh, the uh, demographics are also very good. We have a young, uh, aspiring population. Over 70% of our population is below the age of 25. Uh, schools and vocational centers are all over the kingdom. So we're ready to turn this, uh, this young population into a very productive uh, force to be reckoned with and to be utilized by the private sector. Now, the vision uh, itself, as I mentioned, is very transformative. At its heart, it's about transforming the economy. Uh, Saudi Arabia's economy over the last few decades has been built on our strength, which is what we're known for, the oil resources that have brought Saudi Arabia to where it is. We're proud of what we've done with it. We intend to do more with it and build uh, more wealth an opportunity and create jobs and prosperity uh, with the, the tremendous resources that remain under the ground and we think the rest of the world will need them. So nothing that I or my colleagues say should be taken to devalue uh, what we intend to do with our natural resources. But we've become a large economy, as I mentioned, with primarily one engine. And large jumbo jets don't fly with one engine. So we've recognized this, and we intend to build multiple engines to add to what we have. So diversification will include mining, for example, that currently only contributes just over $15 billion to our GDP, while we have uh, prolific uh, resources still to be discovered. Uh, and, and, and put uh, to production. It will go at least to $60 billion of GDP uh, or more. Services will grow uh, in size and, and be a, a contributor. Tourism, uh, uh, banking, finance will all uh, grow uh, in the kingdom. Logistics. The kingdom enjoys one of the best locations in the world, connecting Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and certainly the center of the Middle East. 
so logistics will grow as we complete the infrastructure we have and also ease the traffic of goods and services across the kingdom and become a platform to reach uh, the rest of the Middle East. Investments will be a key vehicle to achieve this. We have uh, a large uh, investment fund called the PIF. It will be transformed into one of the world's, if not the world's largest, sovereign wealth fund, uh, targeting $2 trillion of assets under management. And, and they're not too distant future, it will invest strategically within the kingdom, but I think more importantly for the diversification purposes, it will also invest strategically abroad, and it has started doing this. Uh, evidence is the major investment we've made in technologies of the future with SoftBank, investments in Uber, uh, and other investments. So investments will be a key. Reforms, of course, uh, are a key uh, enabler. And the government, as proud as we are of uh, the regulatory and the legal system we have in the kingdom, we're not content. We want to be among the world's best in every aspect. So reforms will be introduced, and my colleagues uh, will, will uh, speak about the reforms. Privatization is going to be key. The future Saudi Arabia is going to be private sector-led. And many of these private sector activities that are calculated today as part of the GDP are going to be delinked from reliance on government spending and oil revenue. And that is, I think, the most important thing, is not only do we grow the GDP to 65, to the private sector, to contributing to 65% of uh, GDP, but delink it to the maximum extent possible from government spending from oil revenue. Last but not least on the transformation are the soft factors talked about economic, uh, infrastructure, ease of doing business, but the soft issues are also important. We talked about the population. We're going to turn Saudi Arabia into a softer place, a more pleasant place to live. We're going to uh, strive to make people happy within the kingdom, and we've taken uh, many steps to do that. We're going to promote tolerance uh, in our society, which exists today, but make sure it is universal within Saudi Arabia and make Saudi Arabia a model of other Muslim countries in terms of being uh, a tolerant society. Gender diversity, opening more opportunities for women is a centerpiece uh, of Vision uh, 2030. Cutting down unemployment, obviously, is one of our top line uh, objectives uh, and target. It's approaching between 11 and 12 percent, depending on how you calculate. Vision 2030 targets uh, 7 percent. And as I mentioned, women employment will be a key. Many other factors that time doesn't permit, but these probably are some of the broad lines of, uh, of the transformation. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, colleagues. It was really impressive, and it's really a, truly a strategic approach. But to be honest, we do many countries who try to diversify the economy, and only a few have been that successful. So allow me to ask you, Excellency Minister al Kasabi. What is your specific strategy to make sure that you're among those who have been very successful in diversifying their economy? Well, to start with, Vision 2030 is a proactive plan that is designed to help the government to shape and face to change the economic model from a government-led model to a market-driven model. And with a population of 81 percent that is below the age of 45, we face a lot of challenges as well as a lot of opportunities. So first, we have identified our pain areas and our opportunities. <laughs> Minister Al-Faleh have talked about the sector developments and opportunities in mining, <coughs> logistics, and but also local content. Saudi Arabia have been, in the last 10 years, have imported $1.3 trillion worth of goods. If we were able to capture a good share of such an amount to produce locally, and how can we change the culture from a cons consuming culture or a consumption to production? Uh, the government have identified also what I call competitiveness accelerated program. How can we become more competitive to be a world-class leader in terms of competitiveness? 
So we identify, we are streamlining all business operations. We're fighting bureaucracy. We are uh, looking, at, looking at all investment and trade ecosystem. For example, Minister of, Ministry of Commerce and Investment is revamping 30 laws and bylaws of which will in, put it world-class competitive from uh, commercial law to franchise law to insolvency laws and so forth. So there is a trip, a whole journey of revamping bureaucracy. And also an enablers, we have identified all the enablers and drivers that will make it happen. The creation of a small and medium enterprise. You know and everyone knows that the real driver and enabler in any job creators in any other nations are SMEs. So the government have initiated a commission and authority to look into and to enable small and medium enterprises as well as have created fund of funds that will be able $1.3 billion allocation of, of, of funds to support and to enable small and uh, medium uh, enterprises. Also, the government have created a stimulus packages worth approximately $54 billion uh, to stimulate private sector investment into uh, uh, economy. Now, what are our competitive edge or what are our distinctive competence? We talked about geographical location where the Red Sea 13.5% of global trade passes by the Red Sea. If we can capture some of these goods as a logistic hubs by the Red Sea, that will create traffic and economy in the area. Also, in the area of privatization, as well as uh, government fighting bureaucracy, where all the utilities will be privatized and government is seeking, and maybe Minister uh, Jadan will talk about uh, the partnership, triple P's public-private partnership, uh, Saudi Arabia is keen to develop strategic partnership with the private sector. Thank you, Minister. I think uh, we should now check the proposals, and uh, therefore I would like to move now to Andrew, because uh, you as a truly global company, you've seen so many diversification or attempts to diversification. What is, from your point of view, a very honest assessment of what you just has heard. Well, Vision 2030 is an astonishing piece of work and is indicative of the incredible um, capability that's been put in by the leaders here on this stage, but many in the room and many not in the room, to really understand the dynamic and the role of government in this century. And I, I think a dozen years ago when we at Dow were looking at around the world for our next major asset investments, it became very clear that the many points that uh, both their excellencies have already made about the location of the kingdom and, and its uh, and obviously its natural resources and its natural location, uh, if there was a will, if there was a strategy, and now we see it in Vision 2030, uh, but directionally back then it was very clear that as, as I came into the kingdom many times and started talking to not just Saudi Aramco's leaders, but also the leaders of government, that this notion that the country had to change, this notion that it could not just rely on the one engine of the 747 that Hala talked about, um, it became very obvious to us that it matched what we at Dow were looking for. Uh, certainly a market of size in its own right, a location size of its own right, but also a will from a government and an incredibly capable partner in Saudi Aramco that really wanted to diversify the economy in reality. So unlike many of the things that might be talked about in terms of the next 10, 15 years of Vision 2030, we actually are in the having done it business. I mean, this is not, I'm not talking about a theory. As we speak, down Aramco through Sadara, our joint venture, the world's largest industrial complex ever built at one time is starting up its 26 units, 26 units in an integrated complex that can be seen by satellites from outer space. Th this is an amazing feat <coughs> pulled off by the human capital of Saudi Arabia working with Dow uh, engineers and Dow technology in a professional partnership that has no match for us in our globality. Uh, we have not seen 
this type of partnership in terms of capability. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, our board's been there quite a few times. And what we were very attracted about was what His Excellency was talking about, about this notion of SMEs. See, see Saudi Arabia was sitting on, of course, oil and gas. They had already taken one step in the chemical business, but they recognized that they had an ecosystem available to them, a value chain, a series of capabilities that if you took the step one to add value to it, step two, step three, step four, you could actually attract whole sectors uh, in automobiles, in transportation in general, in infrastructure, in building materials, in construction, auto parts. Uh, you, you could build the mineral strategy, value add to that. And I remember sitting with His Excellency uh, Minister Ali Al Naimi, a true visionary, where he was also uh, talking about this uh, in, in the sense of the need for Saudi Arabia to diversify because it cannot just rely on the commodity cycle. And not just in the field of value add and chemistry, but also in the field of energy itself. I mean, where else would you find the world's largest oil and gas producer talking about a renewable strategy, and which Vision 2030 now captures in full? Absolutely. And I, I think this is the reality now of alignment of a government with the private sector in a true PPP model mm -hmm. with professional human capability that if I had to go to the mm -hmm. what has surprised us bucket, um, it, it's the quality of the people that now work in our operation there. Uh, we took over a thousand young Saudis uh, recommended to us, we hired, we recruited, working with Saudi Aramco around the world. All the locations we took them to wanted to keep them, didn't want to send them back. They were astonishingly capable people and frankly our Saudiization, if that's the term, of our operation at Sadara will be there with minimal expats here in the next year or two uh, and by design. But you have to be a local citizen in its fullest right and you have to contribute to the economy as a citizen, which leads me to my last point. Now, you build an ecosystem based on capability and technology that might come from overseas. Saudi Arabia has recognized it has to innovate locally. It's built a complex use, complex, uh, a series of complex universities, okay, in science and technology, and in particular, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology on the Red Sea, north of Jeddah, mm. which Dow has got a large investment going in a water R&D lab that is world class and attracted world class scientists. Mm -hmm. I think Saudi Arabia is the greatest story never told. And I think we've got to tell it. And I think this is the sort of thing that we're doing here. So I can do a lot more actual realities around Vision 2030. I'm very excited that the arrival of our company as the kingdom was making its move resulted in if you like, a first mover uh, of this sort of diversification. And of course, once we're there, our assets don't tend to move. We'll be there a long time. Thank you, Andrew. So let's move to the finance minister. So we just heard some buzzword like privatization and um, well knowing that after you, I will ask then the investors. So now it's on you to say something. What is your plan according to Saudi Vision 2030? Uh, thank you very much and thank you for having us. Uh شكرا وشكرا على استضافتنا اعتقد ان هنالك بعض المسائل الجديره بالذكر ولربما يرتفع عددها الى اربعه اولا هنالك تركيز اصبح واضح على الايرادات غير النفطيه وعلى سبيل المثال في سنتين Years ago, about 100 billion reals, we closed 2016 with 200 billion reals. And our aim is to double that and triple that by 2020. And that would reach about 1 trillion Saudi Riyal by 2030. Um, second is efficiency. And uh, in the last 18 months, a lot of work has been done to ensure that we are efficient in our CAPEX and OPEX as government spending to make sure that uh, our return on investment uh, is better. Uh, that <coughs> led into the establishment of an efficiency unit, which worked only in the last eight months, uh, looking at various uh, projects and various CAPEX and OPEX allocations, and made the saving of about 80 billion, just rationalizing spending, 80 billion rials. And there's more to come in 17 and beyond. The third is, and the most important um, for the people of Saudi Arabia is really directing subsidy where it should go. Uh, currently, there is a lot of misdirected subsidy. 
people who doesn't need subsidy are actually consuming more subsidy than uh, those who need it. And that's where um, the new reform and the subsidy is going, where we are distributing subsidy through what we call the citizen account, uh, so that the 40% of the families uh, who uh, in most need uh, and in the middle class are going to receive cash compensation into their account uh, to, as an allowance for the energy, refor uh, energy price reform and other reforms that we are making, like the VAT, so that the impact uh, on these families are neutralized. Uh, even the third and the fourth categories, if you, if you distribute the citizen or the families into five uh, groups, the first and second would receive about 100% of the, uh, their, the impact on reform or from reform, and then the third one would receive 75. The fourth category would receive 50% of um, the impact of the reform. So generally, there are a lot of work to ensure that we uh, increase our non oil revenue, but also make sure that the impact is managed, that the families uh, who are in need, the low uh, income and mid income are managed and supported, and that the um, private sector, which is the fourth point, is very much supported. That, as Excellency mentioned, we are aiming for a private sector to generate 65% of our GDP. Uh, if we are committed to that, and we are very much committed, then we need to make sure that we enable the private sector to, to, to do it. So we are uh, engaging in significant um, reform program, allowing private sector to flourish, enabling it to flourish, partnering with the private sector where we need to partner with them, uh, privatizing significant sectors of the uh, economy. So a lot of work, and uh, we are very confident that we would achieve the targets. Thank you, Finance Minister. And um, before I will now turn to, to Larry, private sector was mentioned by the Finance Minister, so please prepare yourself. I would like to give you the opportunity later on to ask some questions from the private sector perspective. But before, Larry, after listening to all the different excellencies to the ministers, to the first business assessment, is Saudi Arabia, under the Vision 2030, a place to invest? Well, Philip, thank you. Um, well, I have a context of being in the kingdom for 15 years. And what I've witnessed in the last few years, as Andrew said, it's a, it's, it's a secret that people just don't understand. Um, we spend so much time focusing on other issues, and I, actually, we spend so much time talking about negative issues, and we don't focus enough on some of the more positive issues. And I, and one of the great positive issues in this world of uncertainty is Saudi Arabia. And it is a real pleasure for me to watch as a, you know, as a partial participant, but witnessing the transformation of the kingdom. And I would, I would say the transformation of the entire region is also encouraging. So this is not just an, uh, one component. I think His Excellency said the right thing. What we are hearing is market dynamics. You asked the first question about, you know, many countries have failed. Mostly market, uh, countries have failed because it wasn't based on market dynamics. It was made by, and it wasn't a full, I would say, governmental commitment. And in every conversation I have, we talk about not just a government commitment, but I think a full understanding that this transformation Transformation is not a transformation for a trade. It is not for the moment. It is not a transformation that is going to be short-lived. It is a transformation to take the entire kingdom in a much more opportunistic direction. And I'm not the one who normally advocates and supports. I mean, I have. To, we, we we represent more firemen and policemen and, and school teachers' money than anyone. We have to be judicious how we invest our money. And we believe that the opportunities in the kingdom can be very large for our investors. We began last year. We launched the first Western ETF. We are working with the kingdom to expand uh, the opportunities to invest. In other words, being part of the, the, the MSCI index which would then expand the, the investors quite considerably. 
but also uh, on, on the private side, we, you know, whether these uh, entities that are going to be going private are going to be going private in the first wave as a public entity or first wave being a private entity and getting prepared for uh, uh, the, uh, being in the public domain, um, we're prepared to be bringing our investors' money worldwide to the kingdom. And let's be clear, we have a glut of savings worldwide. We live in a world today of low and negative interest rates, which is killing our savers. If we could find an opportunity such as the kingdom in which we could invest our money at a higher returning environment that benefits the vitality of a country and builds a better world in that, <coughs> um, we're not only serving our investors and their interests, which is my fiduciary responsibility, we're building a safer world through those investments. And um, this is how we are looking upon as we expand. But I need to get back to the basic assumption. It is market-based. <coughs> the market is going to dictate the valuations. It is not going to be something that you know, we're, going to, we're going to be unhappy with. Even in my conversations with all the potential IPOs, every conversation I've heard was an understanding that this is a partnership with the investors. The kingdom understands investors are going to have to be rewarded. And society in the kingdom will be rewarded. But we're encouraged from the social side. We're encouraged in so many other facets that this underrecognized component of the world economy is going to be more recognized. And we're going to do our job to make sure that you know, we're a component of that new recognition. Thank you, Larry. And ladies and gentlemen, what I promised, now it's on you. Let's stick on three rules. First, if you have a question, identify <coughs> yourself. Second, say you whom you would like to ask. And third, please really focus on Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. If we have these three rules, I'm really happy now to ask for the first question. We have even microphones. Um, here, this gentleman, you found. Let's wait one second for the microphone. Let's see how it works. My name is. Can you stand up? Then the other colleagues can see you. Stand up. Stand up. Oh. So that's nice. My name is Yusuf Ali. I am in the retail Lulu hypermarket chain in Saudi Arabia since 15 years. And I appreciate the government for their all new reforms. Because the reforms, not only in the newspaper or in the media, now it is on the ground. And we are very happy. And the investors which are looking to Saudi Arabia, they are really coming, not only uh, talking or just telling that you are coming, no. Number two, I just compliment my friend, Saudi. Uh, the employees of Saudi Arabian nationals, they are very, very great and they are doing their job perfectly. And we never expected that we can uh, uh, get this type of, uh, you know, employment treatment from the, uh, from the employer treatment from the uh, uh, Saudi nationals. And regarding the PPP, which our Honorable Finance Minister mentioned, that we want to know what all sectors going to be in PPP sector to uh, hear all my other colleagues. Thank you. Okay, cool. So let me emphasize the, the character of questions. And um, so, so, so here, here's one. And then we will bring it in. Um, Hazem Galal from PwC. Um, I want to ask a question about the implementation of the vision. I mean, the vision is very comprehensive, but as all great visions, implementation is key. And maybe someone from the panel could um, respond. What are the b biggest risks they see and how they're mitigating it? Yes, follow up with the question of implementation. Minister Al Kasabi. And if I, I think execution is always a challenge in any plan that you carry. Uh, human resources, uh, challenges, uh, uh, financial resources, uh, IT. However, we have identified. We have developed the three-foot plan, as we say, the detailed action plan. We have identified all champions and what is need to be done to achieve these targets. So at the end of the day, it's just like any other business opportunities. 
completion is, is a challenge. However, we have all the means, we have identified all the challenges and opportunities to, be, to make us reach to that finish line. Now, this finish line could move further, could move uh, closer, but uh, uh, identifying all the enablers was part of the execution plan for all the ministries. And there is a mechanism which follows you know, the idea is, is not achieving or not achieving. The idea is how can you correct and re-navigate and adjust your compass while you're going through. And the Council of, of Economic and Development have created a mechanism where KPIs is established, where challenges and have been, has to be identified, where monthly reports has to be presented to the Council. So it's a journey and it's a learning uh, curve part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Someone? Yeah, maybe, maybe I could just build on. In terms of the PPP uh, landscape, it's really extensive. But the big ones, of course, are going to be uh, an infrastructure mm -hmm. and healthcare, um, education, uh, and so on and so forth. And infrastructure, we're talking about energy infrastructure. All of the power generation uh, going forward will be uh, done by the private sector with an offtake by the national utility, which will be limited to transmission uh, and distribution. Uh, the existing 65 gigawatts of generation capacity will be uh, turned over to the private sector mm -hmm. through a process to be announced uh, very soon. Water desalination, which is the largest globally and growing uh, going forward, given the size of the population, and the added nature of uh, Saudi Arabia will also be turned to the private uh, sector. I came from healthcare a year ago, and I can tell you, government running healthcare and regulating healthcare at the same time, and having to balance between those two, is not a good model. Uh, and <laughs> the decision we, was made, it's just a matter of execution, is to corporatize what we have uh, currently in existence in preparation for various PPP models, but definitely all of the new major healthcare facilities were calling on the private sector globally to come to Saudi Arabia and partner with us, not only with the traditional models of healthcare, but also bring more technology enabled and new models uh, of healthcare, which, which will build the healthcare system, hopefully, that will be uh, a global model. Ed education is very important, and the education ministry is looking for ways to turn it over to the private sector in a win-win situation. Ultimately, as His Excellency Minister of Finance said, this all needs to be positive for the citizen. So if it's a service, it needs to either improve the service or lower the cost or do both. And it needs to offload the government from some of its, uh, its expenditures. And we have a belief that the private sector can do that, can be very profitable. It has to meet the rate of return of expectations of the pensioners and, <laughs> and, and investors globally, uh, but it also has to improve service, lower cost, and, and, and create, hopefully, an investment environment that, uh, that is very... In terms of execution, I just want to add a couple of things. First of all, many new centers have been created that are very dynamic. They look like they're... I mean, when you, when you work around our government today, you think you're in a corporate world. There is a center for performance measurement. There is a center for strategic development and follow-up on strategies. There are KPIs that have been established at, at a high level, middle level, and lower level. And, and it's all cascaded, linked, tied to Vision 2030, to NTP, to at each ministry. And we're not waiting for annual or five-year. We're being followed on monthly. I mean, there are things that are five-year plans, and a month after it's launched, you're being given a red <laughs> tag on, on a grid that says you haven't done what you're supposed to. So we realize that if you start slow, if you start wrong, you're, you're, it's going to impact your long-term performance. And we're really hitting the ground running in terms of measuring our performance and giving feedback to the organization. One final element is restructuring of you know, bodies that have existed for decades have been restructured. If you look at the ministry I am responsible for, and the ministry that uh, Dr. Qasabi is responsible for, these are, have been rejigged to bring entities that used to compete in a way, or at least conflict 
and, and go in different direction, all under one umbrella. Uh, so in, in my case, industry, energy, mineral resources, infrastructure, in terms of Royal Commission for Jubea and Yambo and, and industrial cities, city of science and technology, nuclear energy and renewables have all been made part of one, one structure. So we have no excuse. We have, we ha and, and one final thing is I don't know of any country that has the undivided support and attention of its top leadership. There is nothing that any of us has asked of our leadership that has not been given to us. So we have the support, we have the willingness to make tough decisions, which is ensuring that, uh, and, and the restructuring of government and the enabling bodies. And finally, finally, communication and getting, getting the rest of the population on board. There is a recent survey, a global survey that has been published, which showed people who are happy with the direction their countries are going. Saudi Arabia was ranked number two. This is, this is a year and a half after coming up with some tough decisions that would have been expected to be very unpopular, yeah. including energy price reforms and taking some of the subsidies. A year and a half later, this survey shows that Saudi Arabia is number two, by far, uh, you know, very, very supportive of government decisions. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for one final question. There's a question here at the back. Um, well, that's good. Um, I'm Mustafa Mokas, uh, CEO of Bayer Capital uh, Climate Finance, and I have a question actually. We assist developing countries in developing green uh, economy business models, innovative business model that create social impact and also green impact. And I have a question on the uh, space for renewable energy in the vision of Saudi Arabia uh, 2030. Thank you. Well, this is a very timely question. We uh, announced uh, during Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, uh, a couple of days ago actually, uh, the launch of phase one of a very ambitious program for uh, auctioning about 10 gigawatts through the PPP model I just uh, described. And as we speak this week, we're erecting two pilot wind turbines that the one of them I believe is operational that Saudi Aramco just launched, uh, Saudi Electricity Company is having another one, and we have a number of solar projects that are on the ground generating uh, electricity. But I think the big news is 10 gigawatts of, of uh, solar and wind, as uh, Andrew said, not only is the country supporting them, but all of the enterprises within the kingdom are, are moving forward to help implement them, and we're inviting the international uh, community of, of developers, of financiers, and we want to localize those industries. We want to turn the kingdom into an energy <coughs> uh, powerhouse, not just conventional oil and gas, which we will continue to grow, but also wind, solar, nuclear in the future. All forms of energy hopefully will be definitely utilized in Saudi Arabia, but with the innovation, with the financial resources, with the integration of our capabilities, and with the environment, we're attracting best-in-class international operators to come and partner with us on this. We want to turn the kingdom into an exporter of these diverse energies, including green energies. One good news, in addition to uh, Saudi Vision 2030, is we have another five minutes. I would like to use this for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So if there's, oh, okay. Maybe we could get the microphone. That's Ignacio Garcia Alves, Arso de Little. Uh, I'm very pleased to see this positive uh, development plan and I wanted to understand how you're going to create the trust that the rules are not changing over the years because when companies invest, in fact, one of their main criteria is to get good uh, visibility about the long term and not that they, the rules are not changing. I think that's one of the key success factors apart from those that have been uh, already mentioned. That's a question, I guess, for the finance minister, but please head up so it's all recorded, so what you now say will be even in <laughs> <laughs> Excellency. Um, no, I'm very happy. I thank you very much for the question. I think it's a it's very important one. The government of Saudi Arabia recognizes the need to be predictable, the need to be accountable, the need to be uh, consistent uh, in its policies. And as a recognition, uh, end of last year, uh, the government published uh, a small book called uh, the Fiscal uh, Balance Program. 
uh, or we call it even the budget balanced program. And that basically provides uh, a roadmap between now and 2020 and tells our people in Saudi Arabia, the private sector, local and international, here is what you should expect uh, in the next uh, four or five years. Uh, and the government is committed uh, in writing that this is where they are going. There is no additional cost than what you are uh, going to see in this book. Uh, you should not be surprised with anything that would negatively impact um, your business. You are able to, uh, to develop, you are able to plan, you are able to invest. That said, there is actually a, a very heavy calendar in 2017 of actually positive news. One of them have started with His Excellency announcement a couple of days back on the uh, renewable energy uh, uh, investment that is uh, going to be supported by the government of anything between 30 and 50 billion dollars in the next few years. Uh, there is a 200 billion reals of budgeted amount for the next four years to support the private sector to ensure that we provide the private sector with the necessary support financially, uh, but not only financially, but also technically to, to allow particularly the small businesses that are unable to possibly buy the expertise to be more efficient in their utilization of energy, to actually, we will fund that and will help them be more efficient. Uh, there are other uh, sectors that uh, are going to see significant development in the, in, and, and going to be announced concretely in the, uh, throughout 17 that will pr provide significant opportunities for uh, the private sector. Tourism and the, the, the uh, religious tourism is going to be a significant source of GDP in the next um, five and possibly 15 years. Uh, we are talking about more, more than doubling the number of uh, uh, pilgrims that uh, come to Mecca and Medina uh, in, in the next 10 years or so. So a lot of opportunities uh, for the private sector and, and a lot of confidence that we are saying we are committed, here is what you should be expecting, no surprises, we are predictable mm -hmm. and we just um, wanted to make sure that they receive what they deserve. So Andrew wanted to come in in the question of sustainability of political decisions, Andrew. Yeah, I mean I, I really do want to go on record and please get the cameras rolling um, that the conversation on transparency happened at our board when you make a 20 odd billion dollar decision uh, in that region of the world I mean uh, what what has been astonishing is the transparency and these last few years in particular it's accelerating this is a business oriented government and these are there's no gap between the say do ratio and rule of law and transparency uh, and the will, the will from the political side and then obviously to the economic and the reform side to put this country into the modern century, to diversify its economy for its citizens and its youth and to allow investors to come in and participate in that in public-private partnerships of the type described. Um, that transparency is as good as anywhere we operate in including the United States, by the way. So I would say to you that this is why I say it's the greatest story never told and what Larry was saying. And, and, you know, and we're not here to make everyone, our colleagues here, feel good. This is our experience. Mm. Uh, and and we, we've, we've got money on the ground to prove that. And so I, I would tell you that uh, give it a chance. I mean, uh, this, this is, we, we need countries like Saudi Arabia to lead the way in this modern century to put in place the structural reforms that are creating the uncertainties, by not doing the structural reforms, mm -hmm. we've got the opposite. The lack of will, we've got populism, we've got all these other things. This country's got the courage to put in the reforms. I'd and like it's doing to add it. one last thing uh, on this. Um, I have, in my private meetings um, throughout the kingdom, I was always surprised up until recently that many of the participants did not believe in Saudi. And what I saw in the last two, three years and seeing today is a real belief in itself. Mm. It's true. And that's, that's a contagious opportunity oh. as you continue to believe in yourself and believe in the opportunities and reach higher the investors will believe in that too.
And that's key. Maybe just another perspective to look at. Of course, we do live by the letter of agreements and contracts. There is no question about it. But I think another aspect, not just for Saudi Arabia, anywhere you do business, and whether it's government, people, or um, enterprises, values are very important. Mm -hmm. And what drive, we're, we're, we're constrained by, by the legal aspect, but we're driven uh, and directed by our values. And, and in Saudi Arabia, one of our you know, very strong values is partnership and to meet <coughs> the moral as well as the legal uh, expectations. And we have evidence you know, uh, to show this. I will just give you from my background, if you look at the oil industry, going back to the 70s, when the norm in developing countries was to nationalize their oil companies. And these are trillion dollar assets that, that became very acceptable for a country to nationalize the assets and kick out, and it still happens in some jurisdictions. Saudi Arabia, we did it gradually through negotiation, just like any two business partners would buy each other's share gradually until the government, with the full consent, full compensation of uh, the US companies. If you look at the big investments that came into the 70s and downstream, petrochemicals and refining, when the Middle East was not a proven location to have these global larger investments. Very lucrative terms were given for 15, 20 year contracts that expired in 15, 20 years. And they were renewed more or less on the same term, incrementally improved, but no nationalization, no radical changes. So if you go to the companies that have been there for 40, 50 years, you know, the Shells and the Exxons and the Chevrons, they'll tell you uh, that probably there is no better place in terms of stability and uh, you know, living to the letter and the spirit of the agreements than, than Saudi Arabia. So ladies and gentlemen, I know there are many questions, but maybe the good news is we have a lot of time until 2030, so we can have <laughs> similar discussions. But I have to finish because, you know, you don't know, but I would like to mention, Andrew literally walked an extra mile to be here today with us because usually he has had to go even yesterday to, to Washington for the inauguration, so we are really grateful. And let me conclude, and only maybe one point. You, you, Excellency, mentioned you have a plan, you have the resources, you have the motivated people, so there's no excuse. Thank you very much. <laughs>